Two-minute message preview this week at the non-denominational New Hope Olympia is how to become a palm tree Christian. Many significant events throughout scripture have involved trees. Sin originated from eating the fruit of the forbidden tree. The first clothes, or covering, were leaves from a fig tree. God promised Abraham a son under an oak tree. Elijah was depressed and suicidal under a juniper tree. Aaron's rod of an almond tree budded and produced fruit. The Ark of the Covenant was made from an acacia tree. Isaiah 55 says, All the trees of the field will clap their hands. Revelation 22 2 In the midst of the street on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruit, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem involved palm trees. Matthew 21, Mark 11, Luke 19, John 12. On the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles in Leviticus 23, the Hebrews were to take palm branches and rejoice before God. Simon Maccabeus, like Jesus, entered Jerusalem with thanksgiving and palm branches. The crowd welcomed Jesus, crying Hosanna, 
Save us now, we beseech thee. At Jesus' triumphal entry, there was a plea for salvation. So, the palm tree speaks of celebration and salvation. Psalm 92 12 The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. Today, 300 species of palms grow from 3 to 100 feet tall. The date palm produces over 300 pounds of dates per year. The African oil palm gives a higher yield than any other plant. The palm tree has been called the representative tree of Palestine and a symbol of the land of our Lord. Revelation 7 to 9 says, They were clothed with white robes and had palm branches in their hands. The palm tree is a picture of the life of the Christian. In his weekend message, Pastor Dell draws lessons from the palm tree. From Psalm 92 12 to 14, we will learn the characteristics of the palm tree and how we can apply them to our lives and become a palm tree Christian. For the rest of the story, here is Pastor Dell. Thank you so much for watching this weekend message. And uh, after the message today, uh, we will have an opportunity uh, to uh, worship the Lord at the Lord's table uh, by participating online a communion. That will follow right after today's message. And so today, folks, I want you to take your Bibles and I want you to turn to Psalm 92, the book of Psalms and Psalm 92, and we will be looking at verses 12, 13, and 14. And folks, this is one of my favorite uh, Psalms of all the other Psalms. This is one of my favorites. And today uh, we are entering into the Christmas season. As a matter of fact, uh, we entered into the Christmas season, if the truth were known, a few days before Thanksgiving. But today I want to talk about a tree, not the Christmas tree, but I want us to focus our attention upon the palm tree. And the title of my message today is, How Can I Become a Palm Tree Christian? Have you ever thought about that? Well, I pray that as you look at all the glittering lights and the uh, beautiful decorated Christmas trees, you will not forget uh, to call to your attention Psalm 92, uh, where it talks about the palm tree. And I know that you, if you are honest with yourself, you want to become a palm tree Christian. And that's the desire of my heart. And as we look into this uh, book of Psalm, chapter 92, verses 12 through 14, we will discover some very valuable lessons that we can learn from the palm tree. And also, I want to uh, be able to become a palm tree Christian. And this passage of Scripture tells us how we can do it. And so let's see what God's Word has to say. Psalm 92, verses 12, 13, and 14. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall stale, they shall still bear fruit in old age. I like that one. They shall still bear fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing. The King James says they shall be fat and flourishing. This verse tells us something, folks, about the importance of being planted in the house of the Lord or being planted in a small group Bible study. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we bow our heads and our hearts in your presence, I pray today that you would speak to us and through us. I pray today that you would meet the needs of your people in this hour and for all that you are going to do and have done we just pause to say thank you, and we praise you. And I pray this prayer with a humble heart and with a grateful heart. And I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. I want to talk to you today, folks, about 
what the Bible says, how we can become a palm tree Christian. Now, we are right at the entrance into the Christmas season, and it kicks off after, after Thanksgiving. Did you know that a lot of people, they put up their Christmas tree the Friday following Thanksgiving? The Friday following Thanksgiving, uh, we are told that 94 million Americans will put up a Christmas tree. 94 million American families will put up a Christmas tree and 84% of those Christmas trees are, guess what, artificial trees. And so we have a, a ritual around our house that uh, after Thanksgiving, uh, just a couple of days after Thanksgiving, uh, our grandson, Brendan, he's now 6'1". Can you believe it? I think 6'2", actually. Weighs 220 pounds, and he's enjoying his life in the Army Reserves. But anyway, uh, he goes out into the garage and, and uh, pulls down the ladder, and he steps up the ladder into the attic, and he brings down all of the Christmas decorations and that artificial Christmas tree. And so after he brings all of that down, uh, Mary Ann uh, takes that artificial Christmas tree and uh, she puts it together, lights and all, and it's a beautiful, beautiful Christmas tree. I was reading the other day about these two ladies, these two blonde ladies. Now, this is just a joke. Don't take me serious on this one. This is just a joke. But uh, these two blonde women, they went out looking for a Christmas tree in one of the uh, many Christmas lots uh, in town. And uh, they searched and they searched and they searched. And finally, one said to the other, if we don't find a decorated tree soon, uh, I'm done. I'm out of here. Well, I tell you what, folks, we have the pleasure of living in the evergreen state, and we are surrounded by trees. And to tell you the truth, it kind of breaks my heart uh, when uh, the construction crews move in and they uh, take out all of these beautiful evergreens to build townhouses with the booming population uh, in our area. But that's just the fact of life. But I enjoy being surrounded by these beautiful uh, evergreens. And that's what the state of Washington is known for. Uh, we are the evergreen state. But anyway, um, I have some thoughts uh, on trees. Uh, there's a lot to be said about trees uh, in the Bible. Uh, you know, the, uh, the creation and the gospel, it all started with a tree. Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, talks about the tree of the, of the knowledge of good and evil. Remember that story? And God said to Adam and Eve, don't eat uh, of that tree. And uh, Adam and Eve, as you well know, they ate of that tree and they literally ate themselves out of a house and a home. And uh, after they sinned, the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8, they heard the footsteps of God. They heard God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and Eve, you know what they did? Well, they went and hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees in the garden. They were hiding from God in the trees in the garden. And um, then there's another story. This great prophet of God, Elijah, he uh, could handle 450 false prophets of Baal. Uh, but uh, one woman... One woman got him in trouble. You know the story. 
Uh, he uh, handled these 450 uh, prophets of Baal, but he couldn't handle just one woman, the wrong woman. If there's a message here, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to camp there. But one woman, one wrong woman, uh, will get you in trouble. And I also will say one, one wrong man will get you in trouble. But anyway, the Bible says this in 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 5. This is Elijah, this great prophet of God. He was so depressed, he prayed to God that God would take his life. Then as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, here's the tree again, the juniper tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. It was a juniper tree that Elijah went to sleep uh, under that juniper tree. And then, of course, we remember over in the New Testament the thrilling story of Zacchaeus. Uh, my mom used to teach Bible stories to uh, her children, and oftentimes she would use flannel graph uh, material. And uh, we learned a little song about Zacchaeus, and I'm sure you have learned it as well. Zacchaeus was a very small man. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree uh, for the Lord he wanted to see. I tell you what, folks, if ever I had an opportunity to go to, uh, uh, to the Holy Lands, probably won't. But anyway, if I ever had that chance, I would like to uh, find that sycamore tree and climb up in it. I'd like to be like Zacchaeus was as he was watching, anticipating Jesus come, watching, uh, marching by, walking by. And then we have the story of Jesus, how Jesus died on a tree. Folks, I'm talking about trees this morning. Look what 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 says, "...who himself bore our sins and his own body on the tree." that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Jesus bore our sins in his own body on the tree. Now think about this. When we all get to heaven, look what Revelation chapter 22 and verse 2 says. In the middle of its street, and on either side of the river was the tree of life. Here's the tree again, it mentioned in the Bible. This time in Revelation, it's called the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And so a tree is going to be in heaven, folks, it's called the tree of life. And it's going to bear 12 different fruits in one tree. Now, here's what I want you to see, folks. Nothing is in the Bible uh, without some meaning to it. Nothing is in the Bible just to be in the Bible. There is nothing uh, that is coincidental in the Bible. So, when the Bible talks about the palm tree, it's a very significant passage of Scripture, and God wants to teach us some lessons from that palm tree. It's mentioned here in Revelation uh, 9 uh, and 22. It's mentioned in Psalm, uh, the book of Psalm that we're studying, and John gives reference to uh, the tree. And so uh, my question is, why does God place such an emphasis upon the palm tree among all the other trees in the Bible? And so there's an answer to that question. And I want you to see three, three things, three simple things in that palm tree. How can I become a palm tree Christian? How can you become a palm tree Christian? Not just a Christian, folks. I want to become a palm tree Christian, and I want you to see three things. First of all, I want you to see the person described. 
the person described. I don't know about you, but I want to be a palm tree Christian. I know you do too. And so look at the uh, look at verse 12. Look what it says. It says the righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He's talking here about the righteous. They shall flourish like a palm tree. And so I want to camp here just for a moment and talk about righteousness. Exactly what is righteousness? Uh, first of all, there is a spiritual righteousness. Uh, how can I become a spiritual righteous person? Well, the Bible tells us in Romans 3.10, there is none righteous, no, not one. So that means I'm not righteous. That means that you are not righteous. There is none righteous. No, not one. And then the Bible says back in the Old Testament, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 64 and verse 6, that we are all like an unclean thing and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. So how can we be spiritually righteous? Well, the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And so, folks, here's how it works. When we accept Christ into our hearts and as our personal Savior, he gets your sin and my sin, but we get his righteousness. We get his righteousness. <laughs> That's reason enough. This is where the great exchange takes place, folks. He gets our sin. In exchange, we get his righteousness. That should cause every one of us to have a, an old-fashioned uh, Holy Ghost uh, Pentecostal hold down uh, to just think about the fact that when we invite Jesus into our lives, he gets our sin, but we get his righteousness. But it's not enough just to become spiritually righteous. Number two, we have to become morally righteous. God wants us to become a moral person. And folks, we live in a culture today uh, that is bankrupt when it comes to morality. But God wants us to become a moral person. He wants us to be morally righteous. Turn with me in your Bibles. It's on your outline. It's on the video screen. Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 17. Here's what it says. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Now, isn't that a great way to, to live? To allow the Holy Spirit uh, to guide your lives? Let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. And these two forces are constantly fighting each other so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. And so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. I can't think of a better way, folks, to live our lives than to allow the Holy Spirit to guide us. Our lives. The Bible says there is a spiritual man and there is the, uh, the fleshly man uh, or the carnal man. There's a spiritual man and there is the carnal man. And uh, the issues that some of the uh, fleshly nature uh, has, the carnal nature has, uh, is described for us right here in, in, uh, in, in this passage of Scripture. Look at verses 19 through 22. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, 
carnal nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division. Verse 21, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. They won't get to inherit the kingdom of God. So how do we handle that old sinful nature? How do we handle that old carnal man? And, and so the Bible uh, tells us how we can, uh, we can handle our sinful nature. Look what it says, verse 22. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Here's all I am trying to say to you folks. Whatever it is that is pulling you down, whatever it is that is keeping you from becoming all that God wants you to be, it could be a variety of, of uh, addictions. Uh, it could be living a life of self-centeredness, living a life of pride, uh, but whatever it is that is pulling you down, you cannot overcome it in your own strength. It just can't be done in our own strength. And here's what I have learned over the years, folks. Here's one of my scrivisms. Unless there is within us that which is above us, we will soon yield to that which is around us. We are not going to overcome our sinful nature, addictive habits, self-centered way of life in our own strength. We are only going to be an overcomer in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so I want you to see uh, the person described, the uh, palm tree Christian described here. There's a spiritual righteousness and there's a moral righteousness. And the only way that you can get victory is through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so I want you to see uh, this person described here. But I want you to see something else. I want you to see the potential discovered. I want you to see the potential uh, discovered. Look what this verse says. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. And what that really means, folks, it means to sprout. It means to grow. It means to thrive. And here's what God is saying here in this passage. He wants our lives to thrive. He wants our lives to sprout. He wants our lives to be supernaturally blessing to other people. And he wants to supernaturally bless our own individual lives. And so in order for that to happen, we have got to be spiritually righteous. We've got to be morally righteous. You know what happens, folks, uh, when uh, the Bible says here that the righteous shall flourish like a palm tree, that's what we're talking about, that palm tree. You know what that really means? That means to sprout. And uh, when that happens in your life, when you apply this verse into your life, and when you say, God, I want to be a, a Christian like the palm tree, you know what will happen? Your marriage will sprout. Your life will sprout. Your business will sprout. Your ministry will sprout. Your life will sprout. Now, there's potential that you can discover within yourself. 
And when you are a Christian, like the palm tree mentioned here in Psalm 92, uh, you will become a palm tree Christian where you will flourish in your Christian life and you will sprout and you will uh, have an impact upon your marriage, your life, your business, your family, whatever. And so, folks, um, I did some research on this palm tree. And um, when I uh, and Mary Ann have an opportunity to go to Hawaii, uh, we see all of these palm trees. But I never really did a close-up study on the palm tree until I was preparing this message. And so I've done my homework. I've done my research on the palm tree. And you know what the palm tree produces? It produces coconuts. It produces coconuts. And in my research of studying the palm tree and the coconuts, I come aware convinced that coconuts are borderline supernatural. I believe that the palm tree produces these coconuts and these coconuts, folks, uh, they can be such a blessing uh, to our lives. I've discovered a lot about the coconuts. I've learned that uh, there is coconut toothpaste and it's good for your teeth. So you know what I'm doing? I'm brushing my teeth with coconut toothpaste. Uh, here's what else I've learned. Uh, when your skin gets all masked up, uh, you just rub some coconut oil uh, on your skin and it, it will help you. They say that coconut oil uh, is good for diabetes. And so that got my attention. And so when I was diagnosed with diabetes 2 way back in, in February, uh, I uh, came across this research on the uh, palm tree, which produces coconuts. And so uh, I'm going to be using coconut oil uh, on my body. And you know what else? Coconut oil is good for, it's good for your hair. And so uh, keep that in mind. Maybe you've never thought of that before. But there's so many ingredients in that coconut, that coconut oil uh, that will enhance and enrich uh, your life. I even discovered that coconut oil, guess what? It's good for your belly fat. And so I have a little pouch down here. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm rubbing coconut oil uh, on my belly. Uh, that's uh, get, reduce the belly fat. That's uh, another thing that uh, it is good for us, folks. And uh, so the palm tree produces these coconuts. And the coconuts uh, can be a blessing not only to your life, but to other people in your relational world. And so, folks, uh, when we are everything that we ought to be, we will pro be producing coconuts uh, and we will be producing blessings to other people and we will be such an encourager to other people uh, uh, by the benefits of having coconut oil uh, and other ingredients that comes from the coconut. And... Uh, we want to be a blessing to other people. We just don't want to keep our coconuts. Uh, uh, we want to give them away. And so for years, Marianne and I have been tithers. Uh, we have tithed very faithfully, even when the pandemic hit and uh, uh, we were locked out of church. We still uh, gave a regular monthly tithe. But you know what? God has given you some coconuts and he has given you the opportunity to use those coconuts to bless someone else. You know what, folks? You can't take anything to heaven with you. 
That's what a lot of people say, and I have said it myself. Uh, uh, you can't take your house to heaven. You can't take your car to heaven. You can't take your financial portfolio uh, to heaven. As a matter of fact, I have never seen a, a hearse pulling a U-Haul truck uh, in the funeral procession on the way to the cemetery. I've never seen that. Never will see that. But when we, uh, when we produce coconuts in our lives, I'm using them as a metaphor, keep that in mind, we can share coconuts with someone else. Uh, we can't take material possessions to heaven, but guess what? We can take some people to heaven with us. Now, I've been a pastor for 57 years, and I'm still pastoring New Hope online. New Hope has become a uh, hybrid church uh, whereby we have the weekend message, and then we have small groups, uh, and we have a Bible study taken from the weekend message, and these small groups are really, really uh, important to us, and they have become a support to us, and we dig deep into what the, well, what the message was all about the previous uh, Sunday. But I've been around for 57 years, and someone says, well, Dell, do you have any regrets? And I say, I have a lot of regrets over the years. One regret that I have is that I never spent a whole lot of time on giving. I ha have never spent a whole lot of time uh, on tithing. I've never talked enough to people about giving. I've never talked enough about giving and how God can bless them as they become givers. I've never talked to them how God can bless them so that they can be a blessing to other people. And so the only reason for the palm tree, folks, is they produce coconuts. One of my favorite pies, to tell you the truth, is that coconut cream pie. But in any event, the palm tree just doesn't keep it's coconuts. Many times, folks, we want to keep our own coconuts. God can't give us stuff because he can't get through to us because we want to hang on uh, to our coconuts. Well, let's move on. Uh, there's a third thing I want you to see, and that's the picture of the palm tree Christian in detail. What is the profile? of a palm tree Christian. How can I become a palm tree Christian? Have you ever thought about that? How can you become a palm tree Christian? Well, there's three characteristics of a palm tree Christian. Here's the profile. Number one, a palm tree Christian bears fruit all year long. You know what? That means that you and I should bear fruit all year long. We don't want to just be a tree. We want to produce coconuts so that we can be a blessing to other people. I don't just want to be a tree. I want to produce coconuts. And if the truth be known, I'm sure you do too. A palm tree bears coconuts all year long. And so I've got a question for you. I've got a question for you. What's coming from your tree? What kind of a fruit are you producing from your tree? Are you just a tree? Are you just a Christian? Or do you want to become a palm tree Christian? Or do you just want to be a tree? And so the Bible says in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 16, So I ask, what's coming from your tree? 
The Bible says, you will know them by their fruit. Now someone says, I hear this all the time, folks. Well, you're not to judge other people. I've got a response for that statement. We are not judging other people. I'm not judging you. I'm just examining your fruit. I'm looking for fruit from your tree. The Bible says you will know them by their fruit. So what's coming from your, your tree? The Bible says this in John 15, verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. It's connected to the vine. And so God wants you and me uh, to bear fruit. Look what he says in John chapter 15, verse 16. You did, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Now, folks, God's mission is for everyone. There is not enough missionaries to evangelize the world. And so you need to see yourself as a missionary in your relational world. And I need to see myself as a missionary in my own relational world. We simply don't have enough missionary folks in the world to fulfill God's uh, mission uh, by themselves. Jesus said of us, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Now fruit here is a metaphor for a successful, productive life. Jesus wants us to bear fruit. And since we're talking about the palm tree, uh, he wants us to produce coconuts in our lives. Fruit, coconuts that will last. Now, most of us, i tell you what, uh, what we do with our lives here on earth, uh, they will soon be forgotten long after we are gone. No one will remember what you have done with your life 10 years after you are gone. Uh, they won't care what movies you watched, what books you read, or how you spent your summers. But Jesus, he wants us to do something that will last. And only two things will outlast your life and my life, folks, and that is truth, God's word, and people. And so uh, imagine this scene. When you get to heaven, a person comes up to you and says, uh, you know, I just want to thank you. And you say, thank me? Well, I, I, don't even, I don't even know you. And they will say, yeah, you're right. You don't know me, but you helped me uh, in a ministry. Uh, you helped me with a project, uh, a, a humanitarian effort through your church. Uh, you did something that caused me to get to know God. It was because of you uh, in that mass uh, evangelistic crusade. I heard you speak and I surrendered my life to Jesus. I'm in heaven now because of you. And so guess what? I am a forever friend. How do you like that? Think it over. Nothing you do with your life or I do with my life is more important than helping people determine their destiny of their lives because it's fruit, coconuts, that will outlast your life and my life. Now, William James is credited 
with this saying. It has since been used many, many times. But here's what William James said. He said, the greatest use uh, of your life is to invest it in that which outlasts it. So true. Upon my graduation from high school, my dad said, son, what are you going to do with your life? I said, dad, I really don't have a clue. Haven't really thought about that. He says, well, let me give you something to chew on. You invest your life in something that will outlast your life. And then he said, there's only two things that will outlast your life, and that is the Word of God. Invest your life in the Word of God. Become a student uh, of the Word of God. I have his Bible uh, on my desk. He was a Sunday school teacher for close to 40 years. I have his Bible. Of course, it's all marked up and verses underlined. Then he said, invest your life with, in other people. So here are two things, the Word of God and other people. And I have been doing that, folks, for these past 57 years. And so when you invest your life in a person, you are going to uh, bear fruit that will last for eternity. You might be a teacher, you might be a laborer, you might be an accountant, uh, you might be a janitor, who knows what you're doing with your life, but the greatest thing you can do with your life is to invest it in helping to make a difference in another person's life. Because your greatest calling uh, is to use the gifts that God has given you to make an impact for Christ in someone else's life. And that's been my mission over these 57 years. And God has used me in, uh, in helping other people get connected with God. And many of them uh, have since passed on into heaven. And so when my time is up and uh, I am ushered into heaven, uh, I'll be looking for them and they will probably spot me. And uh, it'll be a great reunion time when we are in heaven. And the fact is, most important, make a difference in someone else's life. The Bible says, well, you'll know them by your fruits. You'll know them by your coconuts. And so what's coming from your tree? The coconut hangs from the palm tree and the palm tree produces coconuts all year long. There's something else that I discovered in my research about the palm tree, and that is the palm tree can handle a storm. A palm tree can handle a hurricane. It knows how to handle a storm. And I did my research, folks, on the palm tree, and this is what I found out. When a tornado comes through, these massive oak trees, many times, will be on the ground. But if the wind is 145 miles an hour, it's blowing 145 miles per hour, that old palm tree uh, can withstand those massive winds. That's all I want to say to you folks, and that is there are some winds and there are some storms coming into your life. And I know three things about storms that will affect all of us. Number one, you may be in a storm right now. Number two, you may be just coming out of the storm and you're seeing the rainbow. Number three, or you're just getting ready to go into a storm. And that's the cycle, folks, that we go through in life. And so we need to learn how to handle these storms and be like a palm tree. The palm tree can handle these massive winds. And so here's something else that I have learned, folks. 
Here's a fact of life. If you live long enough, everything and everybody that you put your faith and confidence in, they will fail you. They will walk away from you. They will let you down. That's just a fact of life because God ultimately wants us to uh, look to him for strength and for encouragement. So let me tell you about this palm tree. That palm tree will bend 50 degrees. It will bend 50 degrees. I don't know if you know this or not, but because of the root system, that tree will bounce back. See, sometimes the Christian will get knocked down, but he's not knocked out because of the root system. You'll say, well, Dell, when people are going through a difficult time, when they are going through a storm, what should be the root system? The root system is very simple, folks. It's right here in the, in the psalm. Those who are planted in the house of, of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They are planted in a small group Bible study. And sad to say, what has been my experience so many times is when people come to me and they are in di a dire situation and they are in the storm. I say, well, uh, I haven't seen you in church for a while. Oh, no, I, I've kind of dropped out of church. Well, how's your Bible study coming? How's your time alone with God coming? Well, that's kind of went by the wayside too. And that's, that's exactly why when we are in a storm, folks, that's why we need to be planted in the house of the Lord. That's why we need to be planted, rooted in a small group a Bible study. Uh, you ought to be able to say, I am planted because when storms come and they will come, guaranteed, I'm going to be planted in the house of the Lord in a small group, a Bible support group, rooted. And so here's what I'm trying to say, folks. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy will come in the morning. I found out that when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher uh, than mine. I found out that when we go through the fire and the water, the Lord brings us out of them. Someone will say, you know what, Dale? Uh, I'm getting old and um, I'm just not getting into it anymore. You know, when I hear that statement, that is a very, very sad statement because senior citizens, the aged people, the righteous old people, they have a lot to offer uh, to uh, other people. Um, let me tell you something. I would say shame on the church or any organization that puts older people on the shelf and they don't. Uh, spend a lot of time or even use them anymore because they are quote unquote old people. Folks, I want to tell you something. I'm 82 years old. I started my pastoral ministry at the age of 25. And I would simply say, God help those people who neglect the rich resource that is there and senior citizens. There's a lot of wisdom in the gray hair, folks. I've told uh, several young adults and young people over the years, uh, look across our audience and see all the gray hair there. I say to them, you need to park yourself alongside uh, some of those and learn from them because there's a lot of wisdom uh, between those two ears. And so uh, look at verse uh, uh, 14. They shall bear fruit in old age. Folks, that's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. 
they shall bear fruit in old age. Someone says, well, you're too old to be a pastor. Have you read your Bible? Look what the Bible says here. They shall bear fruit in an old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing. The King James says they shall be fat and flourishing. And so, you know what that says, folks? That says that when the palm tree is over a hundred years old, it is still producing coconuts. That's why I say so many times, it's always too soon to quit. Well, let me tell you the third thing about uh, that palm tree that produces coconuts. Uh, they are a people of praise. They are a people of praise. If you want to be a palm tree Christian, you've got to learn to be a person that praises the Lord. Praises the Lord. What that means is that you're going to bear fruit every day, every month of your life. And you're going to uh, be able to handle the storm. Uh, you're going to uh, be able to withstand the pressures of life uh, because you are planted in the house of the Lord in a small group support group. Uh, but a palm tree Christian, uh, they are people of praise. Now, folks, I'm just about done, so don't stick a fork in me just, just yet. But every time that the palm tree is mentioned in the Bible, guess what? It's always associated with praise. Every single time that a palm tree is mentioned in the Bible, it is always associated with praise. Remember on Palm Sunday when Jesus uh, sat on that donkey and made his triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem? John chapter 12, verses 12 through 14 tells us the story. The next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. The only other time the palm tree is mentioned in the New Testament is in the book of Revelation. Someone says, well, you know, Dell, to tell you the truth, I'm really not interested in palm branches. I say, well, you better get interested because you'll be waving them in heaven according to Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 12. Look what it says. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands. Did you get that? With palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their face before the throne and worshiped God. Verse 12, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Wow! What a passage of Scripture. That ought to get your spiritual adrenaline flowing, folks. Folks, now I'm almost done. Uh, hang with me for just another minute or two. In the book of John, in the book of John, only a few people wave palm branches. But in heaven, there will be a great multitude. In the book of John, only Jews wave the palm branches. But in the book of Revelation, all nations... In the book of John, they wanted him to be king of Israel. But in the book of Revelation, he's the king of kings and lord of lords. In the book of, Saul, uh, book of uh, John, in the book of John, he was on his way to be crucified. 
But in the book of Revelation, he's on his way to be coronated. In the book of John, he sat on a donkey. But in the book of Revelation, he sat on a throne. In the book of John, he was on his way to stand before a judge. But in the book of Revelation, he is the eternal judge. And in his presence, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. Wow. And so as I wrap up this message, folks, listen closely. Do you really want to be a palm tree Christian? You've got to have that desire. You've got to have that want, not to just be a Christian, but to be a palm tree Christian. How do I become one? Here's how it begins. It begins by realizing that I am unrighteous and I'm on my way to hell. What is sin? Sin is either passively becoming indifferent, don't want to talk about it, to the things of the Lord, or actively rebelling against the Lord. That's what sin is. And so we have to realize that if I want to be a palm tree Christian, uh, I have to recognize my own unrighteousness and recognize that my, that my righteousness, my unrighteousness, will not get me into heaven. And in order for me to be right with God and to be righteous before God, I've got to bow my head and my heart and accept Jesus Christ into my life. I've got to allow Jesus' entry into my heart. I've got to accept Jesus into my life. You may be watching this message. Perhaps you are saying, you know what, Dell? I am constantly being pulled down by this or by that. Well, let me share something with you. You don't have this or that or a few other areas of your life that are pulling you down, that's messing you up. It's usually the same area that the devil comes at you. He knows your weakness, and he's coming at you with that one. And so let me simplify it. Here's what we need to do. We need to come before God and say, God, empty me. You know, God can't really fill you or fill me until he empties us. It's not complicated, folks. Simply say, God, empty me of my self-centered life. Empty me of my own unrighteousness. Empty me of my pride. Empty me of my selfish ways. Empty me, Lord. Then when God empties you, then he can fill you with that beautiful cluster of fruit mentioned in Galatians 5 and 22. Maybe you are watching this message and you're saying, Hey, Dell, great lesson on the palm tree. Great lesson on the coconuts. But if the truth were known, Dell... Um, my heart really, I don't know for sure if it is right with God. I really don't know for sure that I have a home in heaven when I die. I'd like to know. Well, uh, let me pray with you. Repeat this prayer after me. Just say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. But God, I'm sorry for my sin. I'm so sorry that I want to change. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin and I confess them to you right now. Come into my heart, Lord. Come into my life and forgive me. Now thank you, God, for forgiving me and thank you for coming into my life. I've been asked in this uh, process of emptying yourself and allowing God to fill you. Dell, has that ever happened to you? Let me tell you, hundreds and hundreds of times, 
almost on a daily basis, God, I want you to empty my life of anything there that is not pleasing to you. And then God, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Every time we wake up in the morning, there is the devil. And he is uh, aiming to destroy you and to uh, defeat you. And he's coming at you. And you need the power of the Holy Spirit in your life to defeat him. And so, become a palm tree Christian. Um, Psalm 92, verses 12 through 14, ought to be highlighted in your Bible. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bear fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing. So, when you are becoming a palm tree Christian, you will become a blessing to other people. So, I say to you, may God be with you. Go with God, and He will go with you. And now let us prepare, prepare our hearts as we worship together online uh, with communion. Welcome to Communion Sunday at New Hope Olympia. I want to let you know about something inspiring happening this Sunday. We're going to get to participate in communion together online. I want to talk to all of you joining us online this weekend so you can make the most out of the experience and participate in communion. Now communion is for those of us who call ourselves followers of Jesus, and if you still need to take that step, we want to encourage you to participate by observing and seeing what it's like for people taking this step. Communion is symbolic of remembrance. Communion represents the sacrifice of what Jesus has done for all of us. There's an excellent explanation where we see Jesus walking his disciples through the symbolic nature of communion in Luke chapter 22. In this chapter, he's telling them that this bread represents his body, and he breaks it apart, showing the body of Christ that has been broken for us. He then passes around a cup of wine and says this is my blood that has been shed for you. It represents the blood of Christ that has come down from the cross to cover our mistakes and sins, and every time we partake in communion with this wine, with this bread or whatever we choose, we get to remember the debt we owe God. The debt that he has paid is our transgressions and our sins. For his grace is the exchange that we get to receive so. So how should we prepare for communion? This weekend you can prepare for communion in your own home. You can grab some grape juice. If you can't find some, any other type of juice will work just fine. Then grab some bread, a cracker, or whatever else you have that would be a good representation. Remember, this is symbolic. Get it ready, the bread and juice, set it down by your computer, your TV, or your mobile device, however you're watching, and just be prepared at the end of the announcement we will be partaking. We will then commune together, and you'll be able to take a sip from your juice or wine or a piece of your bread or cracker and remember Christ's sacrifice. If you are not physically prepared for communion, you can still participate by imagining partaking of the bread and wine in your mind's eye. After all, the significance of communion is not so much in the act than it is in remembering the debt we owe God. The debt that He has paid is our transgressions and our sins. For His grace is the exchange that we get to receive so. Now, as the music and video play, let's celebrate communion together.